Very excited about this. Really uh, been looking forward to having him on. Uh, is a young man named Vince Dow who came to my attention and a lot of other people's when he was part of a uh, panel discussion uh, put on by Vice uh, Media. Uh, and Vince Dow, welcome, uh, welcome to the show. It's it's it is really great to to talk to you. And for folks that maybe don't know uh, what I'm referring to or haven't seen it yet, what was that panel? How did that come to pass that you were in that group discussion that you were doing with Vice? Yeah, so uh, Vice called me to do this, like, Asian-American political debate panel thing, and uh, it went fairly viral because I came into the room as the conservative guy. You know, I wore a suit. I was collected, I guess you could say, but they basically stuck me in, like, this shark's nest of crazy liberals who were all incredibly loud and emotional and over-the-top. And it just made for a, a very interesting dynamic. And I was very outnumbered on the thing, but, it, you know, they just kept ganging up and they failed every single time. And it was uh, it was a sight to behold, to say the least. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I know it was. And you were you were uh, cool under fire. And how much of, I mean, were you prepared in terms of the form? Did you know what you were getting into or or not? Uh, not really. I, know, I don't know what they told the liberal panelists, but. They, I just knew it was about, like, Asian issues, so I kind of just assumed it was going to come up, you know, they were going to bring up the Asian hate crime thing, and so I looked up the statistics of, like, you know, who's, like, really doing the hate crimes, and I looked up, uh, that was about it, actually, and I just expected, like, affirmative action and whatnot to come up, assimilation and stuff came up, but, no, I mean, I basically did that off the cuff. And um, I, I've been looking at your socials. Uh, it's uh, the Vince Dow on Instagram and Vince Dow Media on Twitter. If folks want to follow, uh, follow you. Um, t- tell us a little bit about who you are. Like, what is your background? You're 19, right? Mm-hmm. So, how did they find you, and 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 why did they choose you? Yeah, so funny story about that. Originally, they were going to put me on. So I, I, I'm not sure how they found me. I assume just social media or whatever, right? Like come across people. I'm not sure, right? But um, I think originally they were going to put me on a masculinity panel. Um, and that, that's what they brought me on about to ask me, oh, as a conservative, what do you think masculinity means? But then it was really funny because last minute they totally switched and were like, actually, you know, not their words, but you're Asian. Let's put you on the Asian panel. I was like, mm. okay, I guess that works. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I guess that's – I assume that's how they found me in social media. And I will just say on that front, the support we've gotten from the movement, our movement, the conservative movement on social media since then has been um, phenomenal. So, Well, and I'll tell you what I think it is because this is what worked for me. Uh, it gave me hope to hear somebody as well thought out and composed as you are at 19 because I don't have to tell you that your age group – is taking a beating in the court of public opinion, right? I mean, yeah. the, the people that get the most attention in your age group are the most ridiculous, emotional, fact-free people. And I don't think they're a majority of people your age. Maybe you can speak to that. I don't think they are. I, I, I would like to think there may be a lot more men and women like you. I will say, to be totally realistic with you, I think people who think much like me are a pretty big minority in, in, our, in our generation. But what I do think there's a lot of in our, in our generation, as is with most young people, is people who just aren't super involved, don't have really a mind one way to the other, and people who are just generally center of the road, generally moderate on most issues. Um, and I, but I do think that the crazies that you saw on that panel are a yes small minority within our generation. The issue is that I think the rest of our generation is kind of scared of that crazy woke mob in a way, you know, because well, who wouldn't be, I mean, you don't, you don't, these are not people you want to get, you know, crosswise with in a parking lot. I mean, uh, let me, let me play. <laughs> I want to play a little bit of your uh, comment about assimilation, which was brilliant. And then we'll come back. Take a listen to Vince Dow on the vice panel when they ask about assimilation. 
assimilation. Is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? Is it a burden? Is it an opportunity? Necessary to an extent, we are forced to in order to navigate this country. Learning how to like properly behave, for example, making sure that you are um, in line. kosher in this society. And I think that means survival. I think assimilation is not just a great thing, it's a necessary thing. Huh. No society can hold together where people have nothing in common, they don't speak the same language, they don't practice the same things. Differences in race, culture, religion, all these things. The, people have fought wars, violent wars, killed each other over these things for thousands of years if America is to hold together. Assimilation, not just good or bad, necessary. I don't think it's going to be possible for America to survive as a stable functioning society if people don't to some degree say, well, here's what we're going to commonly agree upon. You know, with assimilation, Vince, it, it, it is up to us to ask for it. If we tell people that come to this country, we'll give you ballots in your own language, uh, we'll teach you in your own language. I don't blame them for sticking to those things. But when our ancestors came to this country, they knew the, the key to success, the key to the American dream, was not to forget who they were, not to, not to forget where they came from. They never did. But to, but to recognize, as you said, there have to be common bonds. This is the only way our country works. Our country is an idea. We all have to have some buy-in to that idea. Right. I mean, I, I think that, you know, and this should be pointed out, too. Um, like I said on the panel, differences in things like ethnicity, religion, language, etc. These, as much as we want to say diversity is our strength, quote unquote, these are not historically or even today unifying factors of society. Right. There's a racial divide for a reason. There are ethnic divides for a reason. And Obviously, it's something America has always struggled with, but, you know, my basic point was like, well, if we're going to not become Bosnia, if we're going to, you know, stay together as a society, what is exactly so radical or crazy about saying, well, we got to figure out some way to say, okay, well, this is what we share in common, this is who we are, et cetera. And it's crazy how that basic of a take got just so crucified and attacked on that panel. You know, because there's a lot more I could say to that. There are, I think, I think there are changes that need to be made to the immigration system, right? There are a lot of things that need to be done. But all I essentially said, I didn't really propose anything. All I said was like, well, shouldn't we all like agree on something, right? Because you don't form any type of covenant with anyone, whether that's marriage, friendship, whatever, based on like having nothing in common. You, you, you become friends over, oh, here's what, you know, we bond over. Your spouse mm -hmm. is usually someone who I hope you, you have something in common with. And me just bringing that up, well, if we're going to share a country together, society, mm -hmm. we have to agree what we have in common. It's yeah. insane to me that that was such a, a controversial take, right? I, I also noticed, and this is kind of a tactic y you see a lot on the left, you would, you would make a point and there was no... I mean, there was no denying you were right. So they would shift, they would move the goalpost to something else. I want to play another clip real quick. Uh, Don, play cut number one real quick. There are massive disparities based on race, based on class, based on gender, based on all of these things that shouldn't exist. Well, nobody denies that there's disparities or that, or that. Well, let's have Vince respond. Or do they exist because of supposed white supremacy? And when I look at the fact that virtually every corporation institution bends the knee to diversity, celebrates every single Heritage Month, has all these programs, every single one towed the line for Black Lives Matter. I don't look at that so and say conservative white people are in power in this country. As a matter of fact, I'd argue to a large extent, you can talk about what race or whatever people are, but is like a supposedly conservative white interest in power in America. I would honestly say I think it's the opposite of well, that. I, I, I noticed that there was a lot of emotion and huffing and puffing, and it, it seems as if maybe the art of debate is not being taught anymore. Like they, they got very upset with you rather than just sort of waiting till you finished and then refuting you. Do you know what I'm saying? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And what's crazy is the, the one guy you were hearing me uh, debate with, I believe, in that clip, he is a Yale graduate. OK, so he, he's he's graduated from Yale. So he went through the Ivy League institutions. Uh, dad was a former CEO of Citibank. And it's like, it, what's her private school growing up and all that? And in our country's highest academic institutions, the reason I bring that up is not to attack him for that, but it's to bring up like, how do you go through that high of education and, and, and come from this much wealth and privilege and all this and never once were you ever taught like 
well, here's how to do proper debate. Here's the rules of logic and debate and argument, all this stuff. And I think, honestly, you look at him, it was probably the opposite, because I know he's done, like, this liberal teenage activism stuff all his life. It was actually more so that, like, he got rewarded for being that all his life, right? In the same mm-hmm. way Greta Thunberg, David Hogg, all right. these, like, youth Gen Z figures. That's similar to kind of who he was growing up, how he got into Yale, Stanford, all that stuff. So, um that, that seems to be what society rewards, at least among Well, you know, when I, was, when I was young, I yeah. thought I knew everything, but society didn't tell me I was right. <laughs> you know, they, right. Exactly. they told me, wait till, you, wait till you find out. Now I think you're, you're looking at a lot of young people on that panel who have never, ever had any pushback and who have been told we should, the whole world should be listening to you. I mean, Greta's a great example. We should literally make global environmental policy based on Greta. Right. Yep. Absolutely. Where did you where did you get your background and your um sort of I, I guess, you know, sort of your fluency in these not only ideas but the the talent for defending them and expressing them. How did you tell me a little bit about how you grew up and and and, and where you you got all that? Well, I think that's part of what differentiates me and those kids is I actually had to, like, learn those things and figure those things out for myself. You know, I grew up in Los Angeles, and I went to public school in Los Angeles, and, like, you know, I went to, like, a magnet middle school and stuff. And so I grew up in a very, very left-wing environment, the people around me, school and all that. And, you know, I guess I had the agency at least to start asking questions about it. And I wouldn't say I was conservative all my teenage years, but, like, you know, as I – got to high school and stuff and asked enough questions and, and learned enough and, and, you know, thought things through. That's what brought me sort of to the beliefs I have now. Right. But I had to actually like think and, and take risks and, and get pushed back to reach my conclusions. Whereas they, you can clearly tell that that's never been the case. And so I think that's the difference between us. Right. You know, for all the talk about diversity that we get from the left, there is an open, overt war on Asian American um, achievements, meritocracy, whether you look at Thomas Jefferson High School in Virginia, the lawsuit against the uh, the Ivy League colleges. Uh, why is it why do they make an exception for Asian Americans? Because I think the left, needs to exist in a perpetual state of revolution, right? This is kind of what Mao, the reason Mao started a cultural revolution after he already had power. Um, and the issue with kind of the way Asians exist in society, being on average socioeconomically successful and not being convenient to the, you know, white supremacy, white privilege narrative, um, is, is that that threatens them being able to say, look, we live in this rigged white supremacist system, um, white adjacency, this and that, blah, blah, blah. This is why everything needs to be fundamentally overthrown and fundamentally upheaved. And a- the existence of Asians and, and, you know, doing well in school and all that stuff basically says, well, maybe that's not the case. And maybe there is a path to success. And that threatens, like I said, I think the perpetual revolution. And yeah. that's why, you know, we're kind of in the situation. So rather than say maybe we were wrong, we're just going to we're just going to blow these people up because they are inconvenient to the thesis we've already agreed to. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, I saw a picture, if I can ask a personal question, I saw a picture, I think it was on your Instagram page. It looks like you were being baptized. Um, is your faith uh, sort of part of your worldview and how did you come by that and what what role does that play? Um, yeah, I would say my I, I do my best to make my faith shape everything about my worldview. But I would say I probably came to faith through the worldview, like through politics. You know, I, when I started doing the conservative stuff, um, you know, I was around a lot of Christians. And, and so that was kind of my exposure to the gospel. I assume God put those people in my life. And that was kind of the, the journey there. Um, but yeah, I mean, ever ever since, you know, I came to the faith, ever since I got baptized, I always do my best to try to make it formulate the basis of mm. everything I do, for sure. Faith is humbling. I mean, it, it at a time in your life, I'm, t- I'm thinking to myself when I was your age, and you, you feel, you know, you feel like you're going to live forever, you feel like you know everything. I don't, I don't mean you, but I mean a lot of us at that age. And faith is a very humbling, sort of governing, controlling uh, influence 
on what is otherwise kind of a all about me phase of your life, right? Absolutely. But I, w- I would also say I think it's a strengthening influence, too, in a lot of mm-hmm. ways. Um, mm-hmm. And I feel like there's a lot of Christians who sort of even like forget this aspect of it is that mm-hmm. faith is also what gives me the courage to, you know, go into a lion's nest situation like that yeah. and not really have fear. Right. And and what gives me the strength and the courage to just, you know, take on everything right that, that we as right wingers face in this country. So and Christians obviously face in this country. So. Well, you did great. Um, I'm looking forward to hearing a lot more from you. Um, if folks want to follow you on Twitter, it's Vince Dow Media. On Instagram, it's the Vince Dow D A O. And I hope you'll come back with us. and uh, And good luck in everything Absolutely. else, Vince. Thank you. Thanks for Absolutely. coming on today. Thank you. Thank you for having me.